Yes, so thank you very much, Francois, and thank you very much to the organizers and uh, for giving me the opportunity to present here today. And uh, your, well, your link to all the Listeria work, which uh, maybe just to connect to what uh, Pierre was uh, referring to earlier, I think the, the work we did on Listeria was actually really implemented by the, uh, the authorities. And uh, it's probably also worth mentioning that the person who did a lot of the work is here today is Ellen Wemmo. So, She's now working at, at Arla. Um, but looking at the dairy chain, I think a lot of the issues are quite well known. Yeah? The control measures are quite well established. Um, but you, what you see is that there is a big movement toward having dairy alternatives. And today I would like to talk a bit more about um, the microbiological risks that we may be facing in that domain. Just to uh, give you a little word on NISO before I start. Um, so NISO is a contract research company and we are based here in the Netherlands, in Ede. And well, many of you may know NISO for its dairy roots, but over the last 15 years or so, we've done a lot of work on plant-based or hybrid products. And um, yeah, we really aim, we work with companies. So it's, it, the work we publish is actually you know, based on EU projects or uh, subsidized projects, but most of the work, the core business of NISO is actually to do work together with companies and help innovate, um, uh, like help to speed up innovation. Um, yeah, so my talk today is primarily on, on the developments in plant-based foods. And what you see there is that there is really a, a significant increase in, in the sales and the development of plant-based foods over the past years, and this is expected to continue. Um, yeah, just a, a little word on plant-based foods. Of course, not all of these are new. Huh? We, we know that these have been in the market for people with, you know, the, the dairy allergen, uh, dairy uh, uh, allergies. Um, yeah, could be, be cow milk or caseins. Um, and of course, you know, customers who really choose to have a vegan diet. But with all these drivers for more sustainable foods and, uh, and food consumption, you see that there is a, a very big market for flexitarians and people are really looking for alternative pro uh, products and yeah as a result the the sales of these uh, these products is really um, expected to increase quite a, significantly still now if we we look at the yeah the, the constant pressures on on the food sector to innovate and to meet these sustainable goals um, we're also looking at consumer preferences this is really where, where NISO um, helps customers to, to yeah, innovate and, uh, and we have a lot of different expertises in, in the area of, of food science. So it, it can be you know, the food safety aspects, obviously. But we have quite important teams in fermentation, in uh, protein functionality, and all the knowledge that we have built on protein functionality, uh, traditionally in dairy, we're now applying to all these plant-based ingredients. And I think uh, to, to focus on the core strengths of NISO, that's really um, yeah, on, on these domains, so protein functionality, fermentation, and processing. And what you see there um, uh, with this protein transition from animal to alternative proteins, this really brings a lot of challenges. And the, the first and foremost challenge uh, when you're making a new product is to make sure that it tastes right, it has the right structure, it has the right functionalities. Um, and yeah, with, with plant-based, you have such a huge variety of, of choices. So it can be fava, it can be pea, it can be you know, any sort of ingredient. And within the range of all these different ingredients, you, you have all these different qualities. It can be concentrates, isolates, etc. cetera. Um, so this, this tends to be the, 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 the prime focus yeah, on product development, making sure you get something to the market. But of course, there's always the question of food safety. And when we're looking at food safety, the very obvious ones for plant-based are the allergens, but also the chemical contaminants. Um, and what I focus on today is actually the microbial contaminants. And we will uh, be focusing on what this means throughout the chain and what this means for, uh, for finished products. Now, when we compare plant-based products with milk, it is it's really fair to say that milk is really quite consistent in terms of nutritional composition, physical characteristics, and the microbial contaminants even. Um, for plant-based uh, 
uh, proteins, this is really quite a different um, kettle of fish. Um, so every individual ingredient may have its own composition in terms of you know, the, the, the proteins, the carbohydrates, uh, the fats, and a lot of different factors may influence the microbiological contaminants. Now, obviously, most of these come from you know, the, the harvesting, the, from soil, they may be contaminated. Um, the processing can be very, very different, and maybe uh, press cakes, it can be concentrates, uh, so this is actually a, a dry process, it can be isolates, and it's a wet process. So all of these things matter, and uh, that determines what is present in your ingredients. So as in dairy, uh, different challenges, they may arise uh, in different product categories. Uh, so whether you're making a drink or a, a plant-based uh, yogurt or a plant-based cheese, <coughs> and it's a bit more tricky at the moment still, um, we really need to know what is in the ingredients, what does this mean for the final product, uh, what is the impact of the processing. And you need all this information to be able to assess the, the, the risks that are related to the microbes. Um, you need to know what is in your ingredients and what can be expected, what are the levels, what are the types. Um, for all these specific products, you need to know what is happening, how is it made, um, what is the final characteristic, uh, is there a possibility of post-processing contamination, uh, does it support growth, yes or no? How is it stored? So all these things, you know, obviously they go into the risk assessments that you're, you have to carry out. So what we found, actually, and this is something um, by talking to different companies, these questions were quite uh, uniform for a lot of companies. So we actually started a very large project now with uh, 11 companies um, and three knowledge partners, and this is a, a public private partnerships that, like coordinated by MISO. And what we're actually doing is look at all these different ingredients. So first we collect information on uh, you know what what is in in these all these different ingredients uh, in terms of key microbial contaminants. Uh, and we link this with information that we have from the different companies on the combinations of ingredient, process and uh, product. And we are focusing here on, on dairy alternatives, so the drinks, the, uh, the yogurt type, and the cheese type products. So we're currently at the stage of having done the in inventory of what type of microbes do you find, what are the levels that you find. We take the key microbes for the different um, uh, product categories, and we assess uh, primarily the heat inactivation of these key ingredients. Uh, we assess the growth boundaries of these, uh, sorry, the, the key contaminants, the growth boundaries as well. And we feed this into predictive models. And of course, predictive models are nothing new. And there's a lot of information already out there in the literature. Um, but we see knowledge gaps for some of the microbes that we encounter in plant-based ingredients. So we are trying to fill these gaps. We do this using uh, uh, models in, in the lab, uh, so just uh, yeah, the, the typical culturing in the lab. But we are also validating this in real products from the, from the companies. And with this, we, we like to refine the predictive models, so really dedicated to, to being able to do this in the products. And then, as a last step, integrate all of this into quantitative risk assessment, so where you bring the knowledge that you gained on inactivation, growth throughout the chain, uh, together with what can you expect in different ingredients, and uh, try to make quantitative risk assessments that way. So at the moment, uh, as I said, there's not much information available. If you look in the literature, barely any information. And there may be some information on soy, perhaps, but there's not much uh, out there. And uh, we, we are really starting to, to get a much better picture now of, of what you can expect. Um, so we have uh, analyzed, uh, I don't know, close to 100 different ingredients now, all like plant-based, um, different sources, uh, so flowers, concentrates, isolates, uh, kernels, flakes, of all these different ingredients. And uh, one of the things that we know is that in, in any dairy alternative, the minimum that will be used is at least a heating step. So knowing that from your ingredient, you should at least be getting rid of the, of the vegetative organisms. We've actually focused on, on spore formers. Um, so I'll go into that a little bit uh, in, in the next slides. 
And um, on top of that, we didn't just do the counts, but we also took from the highest dilutions of the plates we took, um, from all the plates we took uh, isolates, and uh, these were identified just to see what, do, what, what is there. So this is a, a very detailed uh, uh, slide, but I, I will take you through it because I think there are some learnings and, and uh, important uh, aspects that I would like to mention. So what we did, um, and this is just a part of the results that we have obtained, um, we took different ingredients and we, um, we established the total counts. We also established the, the spore formers. So these are just the, uh, what is it, 10 minute 80 and then mesophile. Uh, we did the half hour 100 and then thermophiles. Um, we looked at bacillus series and we looked at the SRCs as a measure <coughs> for uh, Clostridia, for particularly the pathogenic Clostridia, obviously. And what you see on in general is that the, the total counts are actually quite similar to uh, the spore counts, which is not really surprising, uh, considering that we're dealing with, uh, with a lot of powders, etc. cetera. Um, but we also see that um, the levels are actually quite high, even when you compare that, for instance, with milk powders. And milk powders, you tend to be 10 to the 2, 10 to the 3. So, And we even have levels that are up to yeah, 10 to the 4, or even exceeding that. So it, 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 it really is quite high in terms of spore formers. What we also found is that on the general counts for spore formers, we already could identify in the highest dilutions bacillus series. So this is already an indication that bacillus series can be present at high levels. Uh, so this is also, uh, bacillus series was also found on, on specific media. But um, yeah, in, in majority of samples, you find bacillus series, which is not surprising because it's, uh, you know, obviously uh, linked to soil. Um, so in general, we find it in at least half of the samples. In addition, we find quite a few samples with relatively high levels of uh, SRC, so the sulfide-producing clostridia. And yeah, this is of course also a, a concern, especially when you start to, yeah, when you start to look at, let's say, the uh, sporogenes or, and or botulinum types. So we, we actually did identifications. And what you see in general then is that the, the species encountered on the, on the, the, the general plate counts, it's, it's a mixed bag, but obviously you find all these vegetative bacteria, but on the highest dilutions you find a lot of spore forms already. So this is already indicative that spore forms are a, an important uh, component of all these ingredients. Now, when we look at the uh, aerobic spores, the mesophiles, the organisms that we find in most of the samples at the higher dilutions are Bacillus series, Lichenoformis, and Satellus. Uh, we also find thermophiles, not in all samples, but like organisms like Geobacillus thermophilus were found, and these are obviously known to be super high heat resistant and they can survive UHT treatments. And then when we're looking at the anaerobes, we actually identified quite a lot of um, sporogenes and also tepidum, and these are very close relatives of Clostridium botulinum group one. Um, we actually, for, for quite a few, we did analysis on the, the bow and T cluster, and these were negative, so we're not looking at uh, botulinum here, but you know, just based on 16S, and this is the way it was analyzed, we cannot really be entirely sure. So the niche for sporogenes is there, so the niche for botulinum may also be there. Um, what we saw in terms of bacillus series, this is actually quite tricky. Uh, some of the media don't work for all these plant-based because the spore loads are so high that uh, media like NYP, they just turn yellow. So you really have to get the right methods in place to be able to count your bacillus series. Um, and then doing the identifications, we saw some other strains than Sirius, so the Cytotoxicus and, uh, and Thuringiensis, for instance. But overall, you know, we, we do see this picture that spore formers are quite predominant and that they are, uh, yeah, diverse. Yeah, so what do you do with all that information? That's, of course, the next step. Um, I'm going to focus on, on the three main categories, so the drinks, the yogurts and the, uh, the, the cheese-type products. And um, when we look at the drinks, and you know the, the level of the spores that you may encounter, in principle, it's quite easy to establish, okay, what 
kind of heating do you need? And typically for Clostridium botulinum is a, a minimum of a F0 of, of three applied. So in principle, when you calculate all of this, it should do the job. You know, you should actually be able to inactivate all your, your target species uh, based on, on the initial levels that you know and the types of organisms that you um, uh, encounter in your products. Um, so yeah, you should be able to have optimal processes in place. But of course, we did encounter some of the species that may be very heat resistant, like the Geobacillus. And we also have quite a, a predominant presence of Bacillus subtilis. And here we know that some of these um, subtilis strains can carry genetic elements that make them super heat resistant. So it brings them up to the level of Geobacilli. So just that fact already means that you may, even with a UHT product, um, not be able to get your products uh, commercially uh, sterile if you have high levels of such organisms. But then, of course, there is the, another issue, uh, and that is that, um, well, other than the possibility of survival, you may have fouling. And one of the things that you see in these plant-based products is that the solubility of the proteins is not as good as it is for, for instance, milk. Um, there may be issues with the, heat or, uh, with the uh, hydration of the ingredients, so this needs to be done really well because we all know that uh, dry heat is not so effective. Yeah? So if you don't have a, a, a well-solubilized uh, uh, ingredient and you have dry pockets there, maybe the, the, the heat treatment is not as effective as you might um, assume. So this is definitely one of the yeah, key areas to yeah, to focus on with, with these type of products. And yeah, usually it, it, and it may result in, in spoilage, but of course when organisms such as Clostridium botulinum or Bacillus cereus survive, you have a serious issue. And uh, cereus is another, yeah, as you know, it's, it's an organism that can also establish quite well in installations. So you, with, the, with the increased fouling that you see with a lot of these plant-based uh, ingredients, this may also be an issue. Now, what we've seen already is that there, there has been an, an, a, a recall, in this case of uh, Oatly drinks, uh, where Bacillus cereus was present. And um, yeah, of course, cereus is, uh, is also a mixed bag of, of, of species. So you may be looking at cereolite production, you may be looking at just organisms that cause diarrhea. Um, well, I don't have more information on, on this particular case, but the concern of Bacillus, uh, sorry, of Bacillus series uh, very often is linked to serolite production. And this is something we did look at. So um, we took Bacillus series strains from our culture collection that have the ability to produce serolite, and we looked at production at 12 and at 30 degrees. Um, we've actually done some work even at eight. And what you see there, in this case, in, in oat and coconut and in milk as a reference, is that serolite is definitely uh, produced in these different uh, in these different products, and um, even already at, at 12 degrees. Um, so this is definitely a concern. Another concern may actually be with subtilis and lichenformis, and you know, knowing that these are so predominant <coughs> and that some of these strains can make very heat resistant spores, this cannot be uh, ignored. This potential risk. Um, there are some outbreak cases of bacillus other than serious, and this may be related to, uh, to lichenism production or surfactant production by uh, bacillus subtilis. So this is something we also looked at, not so much yet in, um, in plant-based ingredients, but definitely in, uh, in, in, uh, in this case in LB broth and in milk. And here you actually see uh, production of lichenism and this is also a, like a heat-stable compound, you see it in both of these uh, um, liquid um, conditions, so both in, in, uh, in milk and in BHI. And what may be good to mention here is that the, the levels of cells where you see production of these kind of toxins um, is actually in the late exponential stage stage. So this is something that may actually relate to the fact that like, there are hardly ever any reports of uh, foodborne intoxications of, uh, caused by these organisms, because you, you tend to be looking at a spoiled product by the time these compounds are produced. 
we don't know what the situation is for plant-based substrates. Um, well, we have done some work and we do see production of lichenosin. And what we also saw is that this is very, it's very strain dependent. So some strains of lichenus, of lichenoformis produce high amounts, others lower amounts. But it, it's definitely the, the gene cluster tends to be present in nearly all the strains. So it's definitely one of the things to, to bear in mind. Now, so th this is all on, on, let's say, the drinks. And now just moving to the, the yogurt-like products. So what you're doing here um, most of the time, so the, the plant protein ingredients are actually having a functional, um, well, they are, they are functional proteins. So they, determine, they help to determine the structure. And as a result, uh, it's not possible to, to heat these products very high. So you, you're looking at a max of a half hour, 80 or so. So by doing so, you're actually killing the vegetative organisms, the, the yeast, the molds, etc. But again, the bacterial spores, they will survive. And what tends to be the case for these products is that the target pH is low. So it's four and a half or so. By the time it gets to that pH, you are out of the danger zone for most of the organisms that are uh, potentially causing foodborne issues. But the one thing that is important for the yogurt type products is the fermentation process itself. If this is not fast enough, uh, with the high loads of the spores that are present initially, this is really a potential issue. So you have to make sure that this acidification goes well, uh, that it's fast, that the product gets to a stable condition relatively fast. And um, yeah, this is really uh, something to bear in mind when you're, when you're dealing with, uh, with plant-based products. We do see this in practice. Uh, when, the, uh, when the pH doesn't drop fast enough, we have seen on multiple occasions that you have overgrowth with yeah, bacteria, with, well, mostly uh, the spore formers. Um, and it's really, it's, so it's not hypothetical. And there are, there's only one report, but the, the data are a bit hidden in, in the entire paper. But here you also see that uh, in, in this paper by uh, Ben Arp in the French group is that if you don't get the fermentation right, you get an overgrowth with uh, Bacillus uh, subtilis, for instance, but also like Informis, uh, Sirius or Circulans. So they were all found. Um, so I think for the, for the yogurt type products, this, um, this step of the fermentation is really critical. Um, then the cheese type products. So what you see there is that um, they tend, at the moment, they tend not to be based on fermentation yet. So very often they're just based on starch, uh, protein, uh, fat, coconut fat, very often. And they tend to be acidified to a level of uh, pH 5, 5, 5.5. Five um, again, here, the heating steps are limited. So they, they tend not to be very, very high. So it's more like half hour 80 again. So again, yeast molds and the vegetative organisms will be inactivated, but the spores will survive. Um, this pH is actually not a safe level for certainly the, the Clostridia and, and Bacillus species. <coughs> so this is definitely uh, something to, to bear in mind. Um, and this needs to be taken into account. But of course, you know, everyone is looking for ideally a clean label, uh, something shelf life stable. But you also have to take into account like, what is a consumer going to do with it? If they're used to putting the cheese on the table, are they going to do the same with this product? Yes or no? So you need to take the entire chain into account and the entire like expected use of the products as well. And then, of course, with cheeses, especially with the, the, the harder type cheeses, you're facing exactly the same problems or potential risks as you do with uh, with the dairy products. Uh, for instance, the slicing, and then we're looking at listeria, etc. So potential risks for the for the plant-based cheeses are a bit different. Um, in my view, also the risks are higher. Um, and here, as I said, like we, we if you would go for the starters, like in the yogurts, you have to really make sure that your fermentation goes well and uh, the outgrowth of contaminants during storage will be a potential issue. Um, there are def definite benefits of using fermentation over just chemical acidification. So one thing, of course, is that it can really help to develop the flavor. It can help 
to remove off flavors. I can show you an example of that. Um, it helps to build the structure, so you can actually have uh, um, starter cultures that produce more smooth or more dry kind of textures. Uh, it can even help with biopreservation, and I think this is a nice example. So here we have exact same um, product, fermented and not fermented, just acidified to the same level of lactic acid. We kept it at six degrees for six weeks. The fermented product was all fine. The acidified product was completely overgrown with, uh, with mold. So there's definitely an added value of having um, the, the starter cultures there. So yeah, all these things come into play when, you, when you're designing these new kind of products. And yeah, we, we have quite a lot of experience with this now. So one of the yeah, strongholds, I think, of, of Niso is, is its uh, yeah, experience with, with starter cultures, with uh, fermentation. Um, and yeah, dairy starter cultures are, of course, quite different from what you need in plant-based. Um, so a dairy culture is, has evolved to grow on lactose. Um, in the plant-based domain, <coughs> you may not want to use the same cultures. Eh? So the, the cultures will have to grow on, on other substrates than lactose in this case. Um, because well, obviously there's no lactose present. And the development uh, of the flavor and texture may also be different. So there are a lot of benefits of using um, fermentation. So it can be uh, yeah, just the, the flavor, the, the proteolysis, um, the, the texture that you're developing. Um, and well, this off flavor removal is also very important. Uh, but of course, you have to bear in mind that your ingredients are actually very different from the start. So what we are doing, and this is part of an EU project, we are actually um, doing a lot of work now on being able to predict what different starter cultures or start, in this case, strains will do on different uh, plant-based ingredients um, and what this means for the outcomes. So the outcomes here being fast acidification, um, the, the aroma profiles that are being generated. So we, we are actually now doing a very large study where we take all these different plant-based ingredients, and, and just as an example, it's rice, pea, uh, uh, oat, quinoa, uh, soy, fava, etc. And we are culturing um, the, with different, uh, well, different species, uh, so lactococcus, uh, lactoplantibacillus uh, plantarum, leuconostox, and streptococci, of which we have the genomes as well. So we're culturing these on all these different plant-based substrates with different uh, um, sugar uh, additions, so in this case, uh, glucose, sucrose, and, and raffinose, and we're looking at the outcome. So we do this in a very high throughput manner, and we're putting all this information together, uh, talking about big, big data, it's, uh, it's definitely one of those projects. And, and we try to build a model with this to then, at a later stage, be able to have a rational design. So if you, if you say, okay, I want to get to this outcome, this flavor or this particular uh, characteristic. So where do you start? Eh? So can you have a rational design? Which ingredient should you take to get there? Which culture should you take to get there? So this is uh, this is currently um, under under development. <clears throat> and I just want to give a few examples. This is not directly from this project, but it, it gives a good flavor of what this can mean. Um, so what you see here is that the uh, performance of particular strains can vary uh, greatly depending on different substrates. So what we did here is we just took one lactobacillus plantarum strain and we cultured it on all these different uh, um, plant-based ingredients. So uh, and what you see here is, uh, is, is fava, lupin, mung bean, oat, pea. So a, a, each block is a, a different ingredient. And what we then did, and that's indicated with the red marks, uh, that is the pH uh, in the substrates without any addition. Um, the green ones are the acidification after addition of glucose. Uh, the blue ones, glucose with yeast, and the pink ones is just yeast extract. And then this indicates the pH uh, after 24 hours in dots and uh, after 48 hours in triangles. And what you see then is that fast acidification 
was only seen if you don't have any uh, sugars present, fast acidification um, was only seen in oat and pumpkin isolate. So this already indicates that depending on where you start with or what you start with, it has a, a major impact on, on the growth of these organisms. And in some cases, like in, in rapeseed isolate in this case, we didn't see any acidification. So that meant the, the starter couldn't grow in, in this particular uh, substrate. So that's just an example of, of how one particular strain can grow differently on all these different um, uh, plant-based substrates. What we did here is actually a little bit different. Um, so sometimes, you know, you don't have that choice of, of ingredient that you want to choose. You just have to go with, with one that um, is chosen. And it can be oat or it can be pea or whatever. Um, and what we did here is we took a very large range of strains and we uh, looked at the acidification rates and the minimum pH that was achieved by all these different strains on one particular substrate. Um, and here you see huge differences. So the, uh, the lactococci are, uh, sorry, the lactobacillus are the, the red dots, the lactococcus green, uh, leuconostoc is the, 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 the bluish, and the streptococcus uh, purple. So you see that some strains are really good at um, fermenting one particular substrate, others are not so good. So having this kind of information, being able to link this with genome data, I'm not showing this here, but you can see that certain pathways may be present. Um, th this really helps in predicting which strains to choose when you are developing a particular product. And of course, yeah, as I said, the, uh, the acidification rates are very critical just to make sure that your product is, is safe during the fermentation steps. Uh, well, and of course, you know, the, once you have that pH, uh, <coughs> there's always the, the post-processing contamination risk. And then before I conclude, I just would like to touch on one particular issue that we are looking at as well in relation to uh, the use of different strains on different substrates. So what you see here is, uh, uh, in this case, a quinoa flour, and this is fermented with different um, plantarum strains and lactococcus lactis strains. And in the first column, you see the levels uh, of, in, in the top rows, uh, very particular off flavors that are common to plant-based ingredients. So this can be the, you know, the, the beany, uh, grassy notes, uh, the, 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 the pentanol, octanol, nonanol, and hexanol, for instance. They were very effect effectively removed by these strains uh, during fermentation. So this just shows the power of, uh, of fermentation to, to accomplish that. So I'm not going to go in very great detail, but this is one of the elements that we we are taking along in, in, the, in the predictive uh, modeling that we're doing for, for all these different strains. So that kind of brings me to the, the end of my uh, presentation. And I think it, it's very clear and very obvious that all these plant-based products have quite different challenges, different from the dairy products, I have to say, as well. So for the drinks, the, the obvious ones are obviously the spores yeah, related to, to fouling, survival, um, the hydration of the, uh, of the ingredients. So this is something, another project we've uh, recently started with, uh, with industrial partners. Uh, we know this issue from cocoa, for instance, cocoa rehydration, but we're also seeing this now on the plant-based ingredients. Um, for yogurt, the fermentation is probably the most critical step for the cheese-like products is the, both the fermentation, post-processing, and uh, storage. And yeah, again, we're generating all this information and all, the, all these data, um, ultimately trying to come to a, a situation where we can control by design eh, and then take this along in the R&D process, making sure that you actually develop a safe product and make sure that the processes are robust making sure that uh, the, the distribution uh, and the storage conditions are good. And uh, yeah, with that, we, uh, we really hope to, to be able to support companies with, with this kind of knowledge. So thank you very much for your attention.